So well, here we go. Welcome to our Heavenly Parents Holy Community of San Diego. We think God isn't just a father, but God is parents to us. That's the whole image of God on earth, and it's the him image of all living things on earth come from parents. Even trees come from parents. Did you know that? Trees, plants, uh, yucca plants all come from uh, parents. They all have uh, flowers, stamen, pistil. All insects come from parents. All mammals come from parents. Fish come from parents. And human beings come from parents because this is the ideal of God's creation, to have parents and children who love each other. And uh, today is March 3rd, 2024. And our sermon title is A Home with a Little Money and a Lot of Love is Better than a Home with a Lot of Money and Little Love. Does that make sense to you? Bill Starr made that up while we were witnessing last week, and I thought it was very catchy. <laughs> and so this is, uh, this is part of my family. This is my wife, Siapa. And she is babysitting today. The reason she's not here is uh, Hannah had to, to go to school, and she's babysitting little baby Cora today. So that's where Mrs. Frank is, because child rearing is special, and it's very important. That's one of the, the most important things that we do. And if you ever get a chance to be a grandparent, take it. And this is baby Cora, and these are some of our kids. This is Walter Lucas, who grew up here with us, and his baby Walter the Fourth. This is wife Anna and all our kids. So this is my identity. This is who I really am, a grandparent. I'm abuelo. I'm abuelo to my little kids. So I think this is uh, special. So on the other hand, on the other hand, we think as unificationists, that families and children are in jeopardy in the United States of America. If you read the news, you'll see that. And we believe that there is a necessity of the Christian vision of true love and families. That this is a necessity for our community to continue, to continue to grow. And also, by the recognition of false prophets in our community that preach family breakdown and destruction of the organization called True Family. So what we try to do is present a vision so to, and to present the vision that America is that's false. Jesus gave us a warning about false messengers in the future, right? He said, Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, meaning it looks like they're giving you a good message. They're nice to you. They're just sheep. But really, they're, they're ravenous wolves who just want to destroy your life. And then he says, by the way, you will know them by their fruits. What are the fruits of false prophets that we're talking about? <clears throat> what do the fruits look like? Here, I'll show you. St. Peter describes false prophets and classifies their sin. Because people, don't, people think, well, is a false prophet somebody who thinks is a Calvinist? Or not a Calvinist, or a Methodist, or a Baptist. They don't worry about false. That's not what false prophecy is, by the way. Let me show it to you. Peter says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among us. Many will follow. What was the false prophets do? Many will follow their sensuality. False prophets are talking about sensuality and adultery. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Peter describes false prophets and classifies their sin. He continues, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in love feasts or orgies in the daytime. Right In the Roman times, they actually had sexual orgies, where there was all kinds of uh, sexual sin, uh, that we would consider sexual sin. But Romans thought, wow, this is what you do every day. There are stains and blemishes, reveling in the deceptions as they crowds with you, having eyes full of adultery. How do you know what a false prophet's teaching? Because he's teaching some adulterous relationship between people. Don't we see that in our, in our everyday, if you read a newspaper or magazines or watch television, that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having heart trained in greed, accursed children. They're looking for unstable souls we call children. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they are lured through the lusts of the flesh and through lewdness. Isn't that what we're all terrified for our children about? That they'll be tricked, that they'll be seduced. 
This is the book of Jude. Jude is one of Jesus' physical brothers. He says this about false prophets, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, men spoken of in ancient writings as predestined to this condemnation, ungodly men who pervert the grace of our God into an excuse for immorality. This is a continued thread of what false prophets say and do and the result of their work. And they disown Jesus Christ, their only sovereign Lord. So also, like Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns in the same manner, having been guilty of gross fornication and having gone astray in pursuit of unnatural lust, are now before us as a specimen of the fire of the ages and the punishment which they are undergoing. Yet in just the same way, these dreamers also pollute the body while they set authority at naught and speak evil of dignities. <clears throat> Second Peter, to make the, that their fruits are more obvious, let's go to Second Peter, but there are also false prophets among the people as there will be teachers of falsehood among you also, and in their immoral ways, they will have many eager disciples to whom religion will be brought into disrepute. So isn't that what's going on in colleges? They're saying if you believe in God, if you believe in religion, if you believe in marriage and family, then there must be something wrong with you. Only crazy, we believe in uh, animal evolution, some mindless, godless, random evolution, and that's what we believe in, and don't believe in Christianity. For God did not spare the angels when they had sinned, but hurling them down to Tartarus, consigned them to the caves of darkness, keeping them in readiness for judgment. He reduced to ashes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and condemned them to overthrow, making them an example to people who might in the future be living godless lives. So the, so the example to godless people would be the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't commit adultery. You wouldn't do those things. So Peter equates the false prophets as having similar actions or fruits as Sodom and Gomorrah. And what actions did people in Sodom and Gomorrah that brought destruction? Well, of course, sodomy. Gomorrah, fornication, unnatural lust, promiscuity. And especially those who are abandoned to sensuality, craving as they do for polluted things and scorning self-control. Foolhardy and self-willed, they do not tremble when speaking evil of glorious things. So they talk evil about God, about religious people who try to live conservative lives. They are spots and blemishes while feeding luxuriously at their love feast and banqueting with you. Their very eyes are full of adultery, being eyes which never cease from sin. These men set traps to catch unsteadfast souls, their own hearts being well trained in greed. They are foredoomed to God's curse. What connects all of these verses is that false prophets all have the same problem, which makes their heresy plain through the lust of the flesh and through lust, lewdness. They try to seduce young people. 2 Timothy 3, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of stress for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, profligates, fierce haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a former religion but denying the power of it. We might as well add alcohol and drugs and things like that to it. Avoid such people, for among them are those who make their way into households and capture weak women, burdened by swin, sins and swayed by various impulses. And that we all fear for our daughters, these rotten people, seduce them. Nineteen fifty four marked the zenith of Christianity in the USA. Do you know that? How long ago was that? 70 years ago. Interestingly enough, the Unification Church was founded in 1954. Right? But listen to this. That was a peak year of attendance as proportion of Americans attending Sunday service. However, a spirit or a zeitgeist came over the USA of false prophets. Playboy culture began to develop. The idea of pornography and sexual sin is not sin. Hollywood pornographic culture uh, developed. Marxism, Karl Marx said as much uh, in the Communist Manifesto in 1848, in which he called for the abolition of the family. So this, this idea that uh, professors in college, if they're intellectuals and they're against family values, and teaching kids that family is not valuable, <laughs> became this. Most importantly, Marx said that communism would ensure that children would be educated by the state and not by their parents. And they were educated by false prophets 
who teach them evil things. The Frankfurt School was a substantial organization that created professors that would go out to various colleges and bring this kind of evil ideology into the forefront. Uh, also, no fault divorce, which brought a fatherless and motherless culture to American society, right? I mean, that, you see it every day. I, I found this cartoon and I thought it was really interesting, right? Here's a big chasm. Chasm, chasm. Two little kids, little girl, little boy, mom, dad. And then what happens, right? Next one. Again, this marked the zenith, the, 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 the beginning of all these kinds of things. And then what happened to the family? It looks like this. A society that teaches no particular loyalty to wife or children, or that individual pleasure is the highest priority. That's what they teach all the time. Individual, individual pleasure, whether it's drugs or alcohol or adultery or pornography or wh whatever th pleasure people want, physical pleasure based on the flesh, that's okay. That's not a sin. Only crazy Christian people think that's sinful, or Jews or other groups. So then I show this picture, right? Here's the family. Here's the dad, little girl, little boy, mom. And then the dad finds some attraction or relationship to another, little, another woman outside the family. And then what happens? He goes to this girl. They fall in love. You see all those little hearts there. Then what happens to the support of the family? The family is broken, right? Then this, he, when that father leaves the family, then these children become in danger of falling into this chasm, which we see every day in the United States of America. <clears throat> then now, because he's only interested in this relationship, then now the mother and the kids have to try and fend for themselves and support themselves. Right? And even though they can temporarily support themselves, then now there's this father has another child with this adulterous lady, and now he has no more time or energy to take care of those kids. Happens all the time, unfortunately. And then what happens if the mother, then in the stress of being a single mother, has some attraction to somebody else? What happens to the kids under those circumstances? Then the kids are what's lost. So you might ask, what is this chasm? What is this chasm that these kids are in danger of falling in? There's a book called The Body Keeps Score. It's about my brain, mind, body, and the healing of trauma. And I, it's a great, great book to read because it writes about trauma kids go through under circumstances where their parents don't take care of them and other traumas. This is a study that happened in America. In one study inter interviewing inmates in prison. <coughs> It is estimated that approximately 70% of inmates were traumatized by early childhood by absentee parenting. See, that's what this picture is. That's what this picture is. By absentee par by parents leaving the children, then these children fall into the chasm. What's the chasm? The chasm is cr uh, crime, loss, loneliness, uh, problems, drugs, alcohol, which leads them into prison and things like that. That's what the chasm is. That's what this is. So what do we teach? We teach that absolutely family values are sacred values because we love our children. That husband and wife sticking together is a, should be a major priority in life and something you should accomplish. So we say if the false prophets will be uh, for adultery causing destruction to our society, what will real prophets be teaching and doing? What will the real prophets be doing? Right? We say this is the opposite. Right? Fathers loving their children, that's what heavenly people teach. That's what we're teaching. By age one, kids whose fathers are more involved have higher cognitive functioning. As toddlers, they have better problem-solving abilities. After age three, they have higher IQs. Once children reach school age, the benefits of involved fathers becomes even more apparent. Isn't that amazing? So if, parent, if fathers leave because of adultery or fornication or drugs or whatever other thing, then the children get hurt. But what if fathers stay? Then the children do much, much better in life. <clears throat> they feel loved. 
Kids whose dads are active participants in their lives do better across a spectrum of educational competence, from getting better grades and performing better in school, to being more motivated, valuing education more, and not going to jail. Isn't that amazing? We say this is God's original plan for humanity. That's a, that's a great thing. This is the original idea of husbands and wife loving each other, and then when they love each other, they love and take care of the children, then the children become more intelligent. We say this, why does this work? Because we say love, love, intellect, health, all those things are the same thing. If I told you, <coughs> pardon me, if I told you light, electricity, magnetism are all the same thing, would you believe me? Yes. Yeah, they are. Any physicist would tell you uh, water that's ice, water that's steam, that's a gas, or water that's liquid, it's all the same thing, right? We say that love, intelligence, health, consciousness, emotional stability are all the same thing. Just like, just like other states of matter, states of love, whether they're intellect or heart or intelligence or kindness or empathy, are all the same thing. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Parents' love for your children also, by the way, is eternal. It's not temporary. temporal, it's eternal. What's the next slide? So, this. so we say when babies, when we see mothers loving their babies, human touch at this stage is also crucial. When a loving mother, what kind of mother? A loving mother. When a loving mother hugs the child, the child relaxes and feels safe. When an infant is held and stroked, the brain releases critical hormones that spur growth. Did you know that? That love spurs growth. Love makes kids smarter. Love makes kids healthier. Love makes, makes kids emotionally more stable. Isn't that an amazing thing? We say because God is creator and God is love, then the creation is infused with love. And as we understand, we learn how to offer love, give love, then the world will be different because our children will be different. How about this one? This is from a TED Talk. Here's the, here's a, the citation if you want to go and listen to the whole thing. But she says this. Let me give you an example of that. In one study, scientists looked at about 17,000 children who were born in 1970. They sifted all the mountains of data they had collected to try to work out what allowed the children who'd had a difficult start in life to go on and do well at school, nevertheless. So, these, so they're studying children from minority, minority uh, situations in big cities. And some of them did very well. In other words, which ones beat the odds? Which kids from minority uh, neighborhoods, from poor neighborhoods, did well? They found out, and then they decided this. Then they learned this. The data showed that what mattered more than anything else was loving parents. If you're poor, that's why the, that's why the saying is, a home that has little money but a lot of love is better than a home with a lot of money and little love, right? Loving parents change everything for their children. Allow them to be smarter, better, more emotionally stable, have better life futures, etc., etc. The relationship, because we say this is the principle of creation. This is the central principle of God's creation. This relationship between mother and father is the original ideal relationship in raising children. Better than schools, better than foster care, better than anything else. It's the love relationship between mother and father that allows children to grow to their fullest and highest potential. Uh, since God is our creator and all creations are designed to fulfill a purpose, we are designed to be sexual and to bear children. Your whole body is centered on bearing children and raising children. Since it takes two to create a child, then our purpose to become loving parents and children uh, and children need both loving parents. They need both masculine love and feminine love. That's why we call God heavenly parents. So there's people who don't believe in the Bible or religion, right? We're out witnessing, talking to people. Many of them won't believe in the Bible or God's word or something like that. But they should believe in biological and social science. 
Does that make sense? So bio biological science, social science, child rearing science, sociology all says children who have two great parents, a father and a mother, will do better than somebody who doesn't have a father or a mother. It's just science now. So that's what we're preaching. That's how we want to save souls, right? Save souls, we have to educate people so their minds can understand what's the purpose of life. The true prophets will be teaching about true family. Unity of social and biological science and religion and unity of the body of Christ we call one family under God because we believe we're all the same. Doesn't matter if you're African families or Japanese families or American families or European families. It's all the same. All children from all families need the love of true parents. <clears throat> so we believe Reverend Moon founded our church in 1954, coincidentally at the same time the zenith of American Christianity was beginning to decline. Right? That was the peak of church attendance as a percentage of uh, the American population. So coincidentally, Rev. Moon came just a, at about that time to uh, teach us things. When I first met Rev. Moon, he explained he was called by Jesus Christ and Jesus called Reverend Mrs. Hakshah Moon as true parents to officiate the blessing of marriage. And more importantly, Reverend Moon said God loves America. So America is just beginning to decline from Christianity. Reverend Moon is called to come back to America and revive American Christianity. He said that God sent him as a doctor or a fireman to put out the fire of broken families in our communities. And that's what we do, right? Haven't many families here healed? Look at that maniac. <laughs> I know him. I, and I teach all these things, you know what, because I was a lost kid. I was one of those crazy kids. My parents divorced in 1957. And so I went from house to house, home to home, and I became, uh, what shall we say? Not exactly a criminal, but you really didn't want to meet me on a bad day in those days. That guy was a rough character. So that's why I think Family Federation for World Peace teaches us that marriage and family as taught by Jesus Christ and universally by most religions. Buddhists believe the same thing. Uh, Taoists believe the same thing. So, and it's backed up by both social and biological science. This is the best way to true long-lasting and eternal love and peace in our lives, communities, societies, and our whole world. By making this a priority, by making family a priority. <clears throat> All living beings want to grow to maturity and multiply their offspring, that there is a built-in force of attraction, right? Plants, uh, animals, insects, all bugs meet together to be able to have children, right? They all have different ways of doing it, but that's what the whole world is based on that. It's in our DNA from before we were born. If we surrendered to our DNA, we would strive to be a good parent, a good father, and a good mother, and a good husband and a good wife. That force is to find and create loving families that are loyal and to protect one another and our offspring. That's why if you don't feel love, you're unhappy. Right? If, if you have money but you don't feel love, you're still unhappy. Let's look at Hollywood stars. They have money, fame, cars, and they're still miserable because they can't find love in their families. So having a lot of money but no love isn't as good as, as having a little bit of money, and a lot of love. So we believe that this is the ma major priority for young people, and that's what we're trying to teach on college campuses. That's why we're going there, right? <clears throat> All other plants, mammals, fish, seek to multiply, live, and grow a healthy offspring. This is natural. This is the science of biology and social science. This is the message of true love to all people on Earth. The truth is our witness, and we're a witness to the truth of this in the world. We teach that priority of true love is important. People don't know what their priorities are. They think that their priorities are just pleasures of the flesh or what in the world they're thinking about. They think that's my priority, right? People make a priority. People prioritize external education, degrees in business or, or, or other things. They prioritize, I have to go to school, I have to work hard, I have to get good grades, I have to pay tuition, I have to do these things, or I'll be a failure in life. They prioritize that, right? But likewise, they're not prioritizing family values. 
And our goal is to help to teach them that the main priority of getting a degree or going to college or doing whatever, you, the main priority is families of true love. That's the main priority of life. That's the main biological, social priority of life. Our whole belief is based upon prioritizing family and love in our families. That this is our purpose of creation. The secret to that is your mind or intellect. For example, if you want to be a teacher, you go to school, you know it's hard, you know you have to work through college, you study and you study and study. Your mind says, I have to study and I have to get great because I really want to be a teacher. Or you want to be an engineer, or you want to be a scientist, or you want to be whatever in the world you want to be. Your mind says, I have to work hard at this and then get better at it and then I'll succeed in my life and fulfill my dream of being an engineer or a rocket scientist or whatever in the world you want. A computer technician, a, a health aide, or whatever, whatever in the world it is, right? Which we call the first blessing of God, our mind or intellect to find God, love God, love your family, be a good husband, be a good wife. That's what we should be prioritizing in our life of faith. When your intellect comes to know God and who your true identity is, your real identity is to be a child of God and to be receiving God's guidance and love from your creator because that's what you are intended to do. So that you will become a true parent and raise a family of true love that is a blessing for your children, your grandchildren, and for all humanity. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I hope you're inspired. <laughs>